My name is Albert Osman, and I've always worked in construction or logging. Back in 1924, after working over a year on a construction job, I figured I deserved a vacation. One of my hobbies was looking for gold mines, and British Columbia was famous for them. So, I decided to take my vacation there and do some poking around, which led me to the head of the Toba River Inlet. I hopped on a steamship to Lund, British Columbia, where I hired an old Indian to take me to the head of the Toba Inlet. This Indian guy loved talking and shared stories about a lost mine where a white man supposedly brought out gold. He'd be away for a few days, return with a bag of gold, and spend a lot at saloons. One day he left and never came back. Locals said a Sasquatch killed him. I had never heard of a Sasquatch, so I asked the old Indian about it. He explained they were large, hairy beings, more like people than animals, living in the mountains. He mentioned his uncle saw tracks two feet long, and he himself saw one that was over eight feet tall. I told him I didn't believe in such legends about mountain giants. Maybe they existed long ago, but not now. The Indian just looked at me and said there weren't many left, but they still existed. We eventually arrived at the head of the inlet late in the afternoon, and I set up camp at the mouth of a creek. The old Indian stayed for supper, and I told him to look out for me in about three weeks, planning to camp at the same spot when I returned. The next morning, I grabbed my rifle but left most of my equipment at camp. I wanted to find some deer trails that might lead me further up the mountains. As I explored the inlet, I saw a pass in the mountain I wanted to check out. I spent most of the afternoon searching for a trail with no luck, except for a hogback running down to the beach. I bushwhacked a trail from there and headed back to camp. That afternoon, I packed up my gear to be ready for the next day. My equipment included a 30-30 Winchester rifle and a homemade prospecting pick with an axe on one end. I made a leather case for the pick, attaching it to my belt together with my knife. My supplies mainly consisted of canned goods, bacon, beans, prunes, macaroni, cheese, pancake flour, hardtack, snuff, butter, and canned milk. The storekeeper also gave me tins for sugar, salt, and matches to keep them dry. I planned to stash some food under some tree fall not far from camp so I'd have it when I returned. In the end, everything went into my pack. A sleeping bag, ground sheet, a small frying pan, and an aluminum pot for water. As I used up the canned food, I figured I'd have plenty of empty cans to cook with. The following morning, I had an early breakfast repacked and started up the hog back. My pack must have weighed at least 80 pounds besides my rifle. After an hour of trekking, I had to stop and rest. I kept hiking and resting all morning until when I reached a flat area below a rock bluff with a bunch of willow trees. There, I made a wooden shovel and dug for water. About a foot down, the water started to seep in, so I decided to camp there for the night and scout around for the best way to keep heading up the trail. I made it up the mountain to about a thousand feet, and wow, what a view. I could see over the islands and the strait, tugboats with long booms, and fishing boats going in all directions. It was beautiful. The next day, I spent my time prospecting, but didn't find any signs of minerals. I did find a deer trail leading towards the pass I'd noticed on my way up the inlet. Early the following morning, I set out again. It was cool outside, but the trail was steep, and my heavy pack didn't make things easier. After three hours of climbing, I was exhausted and decided to rest on the other side of a ravine. From where I was resting, I saw a yellow spot below some small trees, so I moved there and started digging for water. I made a small shovel from cedar bark and found a little spring. There was just enough water to collect and have my lunch. After resting till evening, I finally made it over the pass that night. From there, it was all downhill, which was definitely easier. But I was hungry and tired, 
so I made camp at the first bunch of trees I came to. As I tried to size up the terrain, I decided to head northeast, as going west would lead to another inlet's lowlands. I made good time going downhill all day and covered about 10 miles until I found a small spring and a big black hemlock tree, a perfect campsite. I spent two days there resting and prospecting. The first night, I shot a small deer, which really helped with my food supply. Two days later, I found a great campsite near two good-sized cypress trees close to a rock wall with a nice little spring just below them. I decided to make this my permanent camp and cut a lot of brush for my bed between the trees. I rigged up a pole from the rock wall to hang my backpack on and arranged some rocks for my fireplace. It was a really nice setup, and that's when things began to happen. I've been told I'm a heavy sleeper, and not much wakes me up, especially on a good bed like the one I had made here. When I woke up the next morning, I noticed things had been disturbed. Nothing seemed to be missing, so I sat down and roasted a small game bird I had gotten earlier for breakfast. That night, I filled up the magazine of my 3030. Plus, I had a full box of 20 shells and six more in my coat pocket. I put my rifle under the edge of my sleeping bag, thinking maybe a porcupine had visited me. Porcupines love leather, so I put my shoes in the bottom of my sleeping bag. The next morning, I found my backpack had been emptied out. Someone had turned the sack upside down, but it was still hanging on the pole by the shoulder straps where I'd put it. That's when I noticed a half-pound package of prunes and my pancake flour were missing, but the salt bag wasn't touched. This seemed odd since porcupines love salt. I looked for tracks but found none. I didn't think it could be a bear because they usually tear things up. I stayed close to camp for the next few days in case whatever it was came back. I climbed up on a big rock with a good view of the camp, but nothing showed up. Honestly, I hoped it was a porcupine so I could make a good stew. The visits continued for the next three nights. One particular night, it looked cloudy and like it might rain. I took special notice of how everything was arranged and made sure my backpack was closed. I found myself suddenly awakened by something picking me up. I was half asleep and at first couldn't remember where I was, but then it came back quickly, remembering that it was on this prospecting trip, and in my sleeping bag, my first thought was, it must be a snow slide, but there is no snow around my camp. Then it felt like I was tossed on the back of a horse, but then I could feel whoever it was, was walking. My mind was racing, trying to think of what kind of animal this could be. I tried to get to my knife and cut away my bag, but I was in an almost sitting position, and the knife was under me. I just can't get a hold of it. But the rifle was in front of me and had good hold of that. I was not going to let go of it at times. I could feel my backpack touching me and can feel the cans rattling around on my back. After what seemed like an hour, I could feel we are going up a steep hill. I could feel myself being risen up every step. Whatever was carrying me was breathing hard and sometimes I heard a slight cough. Now I knew this had to be one of the mountain squatch giants the old Indian told me about. I was in a very uncomfortable position, unable to move. I was sitting on my feet, and one of the boots in the bottom of the bag was sideways, with a solo across my foot, which was very uncomfortable, but I couldn't move. It was really hot inside the sleeping bag, and was lucky for me that this creature's hand was not big enough to close up the whole bag. When you pick me up, there is still a small opening at the top. Otherwise, I would have choked to death. At this point, he was now going downhill. I could feel myself touching the ground at times, and one time I was even being dragged. Then he seemed to get on level ground and was going at a trot for a long time, but this time I'd cram some of my legs, and the pain was terrible. I was really hoping he was going to get to the place he was soon, because I could hardly stand this movement any longer. And then he went a pill again, which didn't hurt so bad. 
while this was going on, I tried to estimate the distance and directions as near as I could guess. We were about three hours traveling. I had no idea what time it was when it started, as I was asleep when he picked me up. Finally, he stopped and let me down. Then he dropped my backpack. I could hear the cans rattle. I heard some sort of strange chatter, like some type of talk that I didn't understand. The ground was sloping, so when he let go of my sleeping bag, I rolled downhill a little bit and finally poked my head out and got some fresh air, tried to straighten my legs and crawl out, but my legs were really numb. It was still dark out, so I could not see what this creature looked like. I tried to massage my legs to get some life back in them and get my shoes on. I could hear now would seem like there was four of them, and they were standing around me, continuing to talk to each other in a strange way. I never heard of a Sasquatch before and didn't really believe in them, but I knew now I was right among them. I didn't know what they wanted, but I had to figure out how to get away from them. I got to see the outline of them now as I started to get lighter. It was cloudy with a light sprinkle. The feeling started coming back in my legs, but my left foot was really sore on top where it was resting against my boots. In the bottom of I had my compass and my prospecting glass on a string around my neck. The compass was in my left hand shirt pocket, my glass in my right hand pocket. I tried to figure out my location and I could see, but I was in a small valley or basin. It was about eight to 10 acres surrounded by high mountains on the southeast side. There was a V-shape opening about eight foot wide at the bottom in about 20 foot high at the highest point. That must have been the way I came in. But now, how do I get out? The old Sasquatch was now sitting near this opening. I moved my belongings up close to the west wall where there were two small cypress trees and thought this would be good for a shelter for the time being until I find out what these creatures want with me and how I can get away from here. I emptied out my backpack to see what I had left in the line of food. Home I can, goods were intact, and I had one can of coffee, also three small cans of milk and two packages of hardtack and butter, but my prunes and macaroni were missing also. My full box of shells for my rifle which left me with only my knife. I couldn't find my matches, but I knew I could start a fire with my prospecting glass. When the sun was shining, I wanted to find some dry wood, but there was no wood to be found. I had a good look over the valley from where I was, but the boy and the girl creature were always watching me from behind some juniper brush. I decided there must be some water around here, the ground was leaning towards the opening in the wall. Then there must be water at the upper end of this valley, where the green grass was. So I went looking for water, right at the head under a cliff. There was a nice spring that disappeared. Underground I got a drink and a full can of water. When I got back, the young boy creature was looking over my belongings, but didn't touch anything. When I was walking back, I noticed that the other three were sleeping on the east side wall of the valet, where there was a shelf in the mountainside with it overhanging rock. The floor was covered with lots of moss, and they had some kind of blankets woven out of narrow strips of cedar bark packed with dry moss. They looked very practical and warm, with no need of washing. The first day I was there, nothing much happened. I had to eat my food cold. The young male was getting braver and was coming near to me and seemed very curious. One of my snuff boxes was empty, so I tossed it towards him when he saw it coming. He sprang up just like a cat and grabbed it. He went over to his sister and showed her. They found out how to open and close it and spent all day playing with it the next morning. I made up my mind to leave this place, even if I had to shoot my way out. I couldn't stay much longer. I only had enough food to last me till I got back to the Toba Inlet. I didn't really know which direction I was going to go, but I thought I would go downhill 
and would hopefully come out near civilization at some point and then rolled up my sleeping bag, put inside of my backpack, packed a few cans that I had swung the sack over my back, put a shell on the chamber of my rifle and started for the opening on the wall. The old Sasquatch got up and held up his hands, his though he would push me back. I pointed to the opening that I wanted to go out, but he stood there pushing towards me and said something that sounded like Soka Soka. I backed up and didn't want to be too close. I thought if I had to shoot my way out, this 30-30 might not be that effective on this big creature, and I could only make him mad. I only had six shells, so... I decided to wait. There must be a better way than killing him in order to get out of here. I went back to my little campsite to try to figure out another way to get out. I thought to myself, maybe I can make friends with the two young ones and they might help me, but I didn't know how to talk to them. But there's still the question of what direction I would go if I could get out. I had to at least bend 25 miles northeast of the Toba Inlet when I was kidnapped. This creature must have traveled at least 25 miles in the three hours he carried me. I thought to myself that if he carried me west, we would be near salt water. Same thing if he had went south, therefore he must have gone northeast. So if I was to go south and over two mountains, I must have salt water someplace between Lund and Vancouver. The following day, I didn't see the old lady until about 4 p.m. She came home with her arms full of grasses and twigs and all kinds of spruce and hemlock, as well as some kind of nuts that grow on the ground. I've seen lots of them on Vancouver Island. The young male went up one of the mountain to the east every day, and I could see that he could climb better than a mountain goat. He picked some kind of grass with long, sweet roots. He gave me some one day, and it tasted really sweet. I gave him another snuff box with about a teaspoon of snuff left in it. He tasted it and then went back to the old man. He licked it with his tongue, and they had a long chat. The young man pointed to the old man and said something like, Ook, I got the idea that the old man likes snuff. The young male wanted a box for the old man. I shook my head, my motion with my hands, for the old man to come over to me. I don't think the young male understood what I meant. He went to his sister and did not come near me again that day. I had now been there six days, but I thought I was making progress. If I could only get the old man to come over to me and get him to eat a full box of snuff that would kill him for sure, and that way kill himself, I wouldn't be guilty of murder. The old lady was a meek old thing, and the young female seemed like she wouldn't hurt anyone. The young male might have been between 11 and 18 years old, in about 7 foot tall, and probably weighed around 300 pounds. His chest looked to be 50 to 55 inches, and his waist about 36 to 38 inch. He had wide jaws near a forehead that slanted upward round at the back, about 4 or 5 inch higher than his forehead. The hair on their heads was about 6 in long. The hair on the rest of their body was short and thick in places. I was thinking that this was probably a stopover place. And the plants and the sweet roots on the mountainside might have been in season. This time of year, they seem to be most interested in them. The roots have a very sweet and satisfying taste. Anyways, seem to do everything for a reason and wasted no time on anything when they were not looking for food. The old man and the old lady were resting, but the boy and the girl were always climbing something or some other exercise. Favorite position was to take hold of his feet with his hands and balance on his rump, then bounce forward. The idea seemed to be to see how far he could go without his feet or hands touching the ground. Sometimes he made it 20 foot. I was thinking, what do they want with me? They must understand I cannot stay here forever. I'll soon have to make my break for freedom. I wasn't mistreated in any way, and it seemed the old man was coming closer to me each day and was really interested in my snuff, always watching me 
when I take a pinch one morning after I had breakfast. Both the old man and the boy came and sat down only 10 feet away from me this morning. I made coffee. I think when I was making the coffee, the aroma is what brought them over. I was sitting there eating hard tack with plenty of butter on it, and sipping coffee really tasted good, smacking my lips, pretending it was better than it really was. I set can of snuff down in the old mail, grabbed it and emptied it into his mouth and licked the inside of the can. After a few minutes, his eyes began to roll over on his head. He was looking straight up. I could see. He was sick. Then he grabbed my coffee can that was half empty and emptied that in his mouth grounds and all that. Didn't do any good. He stuck his head between his legs and rolled forwards a few times away from me and began to squeal like a stuck pig. I grabbed my rifle and said to myself, this is it. If he comes for me, I will shoot him. Plumb between the eyes. But he started for the spring. He needed water. I packed my sleeping bag in my backpack with a few cans I had left. And the young male ran over to his mother and she began to squeal. I started for the opening on the wall and I just made it. The old lady was right behind me and I fired one shot at the rock over her head. I guess she never seen a rifle fired before. She turned and ran inside the wall. I put another round into the chamber of my rifle and started downhill, looking back over my shoulder every so often to see if they were coming. I was in a canyon, the ground was clear, and I made good time. I thought I had to have made three miles and some world record time. I came to a turn in the canyon and had the sun on my left that meant I was going south, and then the canyon turned west. I decided to climb the ridge ahead of me. I knew that I must have two mountain ridges between me and salt water, and by climbing this ridge, I would have a good view of the canyon, and I could see if the Sasquatch were coming after me. My pack was pretty light, and I was able to make good time up the hill. I stopped soon after to look back where I came from, but nobody followed me. As it came over the ridge, I could see Mount Baker. That's when I knew I was going in the right direction. I was hungry and tired, and I opened my backpack to see what I had to eat. I decided to rest here for a while. I had a good view of the mountainside, and if the old man was coming, I had the advantage because I was up above him to get me. He would have to come up a steep hill. He never came. And I started down the mountainside. It was easy going. It wasn't too steep and not much underbrush. I made it down the creek at the bottom of this canyon. And I felt a lot safer now. I made a fire between two big boulders. And the next morning when I woke up, I was feeling terrible. My feet were sore from dirty socks. My legs are sore. My stomach was upset. I really wasn't sure if I was going to make it. Hope that mountain. I finally made it to the top. It took me six hours to get there. It was cloudy, and the visibility was about a mile. I knew I had to go downhill after about two hours. I got down to the heavy timber and sat down to rest. I could hear a motor running hard at times, then stop. I listened to this for a while and decided the song was coming from a logging area. I found people and told them that I was a prospector and was lost. I didn't want to tell them that I've been kidnapped by a group of Sasquatch, and if I had told them, they would have probably said I was crazy. The following day, I went down from a logging camp on the Salmon Arm branch of the Sechelt Inlet. From there, I took a steamboat back to Vancouver. This was absolutely my last prospecting trip and my only experience with what is known. Sasquatch... I knew that 1924, there were four Sasquatches living there, might only be two. Now the old man and the old lady might be dead at this time.